you stand all over the building. One of the ways that we honor the reading of the word of the Lord is we stand. It doesn't make us better, more sanctified, or anything like that. But what it does do is it's one of the ways that we choose to honor the, the word of the Lord. It's like taking your hat off when you walk in someone's house or taking your shoes off. We stand as we honor the reading of the word of God. If you've got Numbers chapter 13, shout, I got it. We are reading uh, from a New King James scripture, uh, and we've been doing, we've been studying Numbers 13, number 13. We've been studying that as a series the last handful of weeks, and this is the last week that I'll be in chapter 13, and we'll build on another series um, beginning next week, but uh, we understand that this to be uh, the space where the children of Israel uh, came and had a dialogue about what their next level would look like. There was a promise that God had given them a land that would be theirs. And the reality is that when they had an opportunity to move into this promised place, fear gripped them and they made a decision not to go across to the other side. Uh, and because of that, God had a problem with that and, uh, and he allowed there to be a period in time of being in the wilderness, being in the wilderness. And I want to read a little bit from the last portion of this conversation. We're going to start at verse 31. Uh, the children have now, the spies have gone over to look at the land. They come back and they tell Moses that the land is, is exactly what we thought it would be. Um, he says that they, they showed him the fruit from the land around verse 31. 39, 29 rather, he starts to tell them who's all in the land, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and they said, we can't go do it. About verse 30, he's, uh, Caleb said, well, we actually can. Let's go and possess the land at once. And, then, and here we are, verse 31, uh, when, when an older generation uh, listened to the the vigor of a new generation, they quiet them down, verse 31, but the men who had gone up with them said, but we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we are. And they have the children uh, of Israel and they gave rather the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they spied out saying, the land which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. And the word of the Lord is blessed. I want you to find three people and say, in the wilderness. In the wilderness. In the wilderness. All right. Okay, those were the wrong three people. I want you to find three more people. And I want you to tell them in the wilderness. In the wilderness. So, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the word of God, for in it are the treasures that feed our soul. You make our life rich because of the word of God. And, oh, God, if we only would follow your statutes, the thing called life would work better. So, Father, I pray that in these next few moments you would send an anointing that makes preaching the gospel easy. And you would send an anointing that makes preaching and receiving the gospel rather even easier. Holy Spirit, I thank you for the instruction. I thank you for the challenge that you are proceeding out from us. So I pray that you would teach me in this moment how to decrease, that your word might increase in our lives. And that we would be transformed, not just changed, transformed by the word. And in this, Lord, we give you all the glory and the honor. And it's in the matchless name of Jesus Christ we pray. Somebody shout amen. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. Smile at somebody say, relax, it's just church, it's just church. Relax, relax, it's just church, it's just church. With the seriousness of what it means to be in church, but I don't want you afraid. I want to talk to you about decisions. Somebody shout decisions. Somebody shout decisions. I want to spend a handful of moments and I want to discuss decisions because decisions become critical for the elevation of anybody's life. As I mentioned in first service, decisions are the stairs of your life that take you from one level in your journey to another level. 
and in each, in each space of our lives, you must make the choice to make, uh, to make your life be what God challenged, told you that your life could be. Decisions don't always come easy. I would never purport that making decisions are, are easy because some have an emotional toll. Others have an economic toll. Others send you into a space of the unknown. So decision making is never always easy. Sometimes making a decision will fight against what you want. And that's the reality is that some things that you personally want, you, you'll be forced to make a decision that may go against that or may, may, may stand with that. Decisions are powerful, por, por, uh, powerful things that God has given us in the world to drive our lives forward. And if you're a person that don't want to make decisions or if you're a person that doesn't like to make decisions or perhaps you're a person that likes to sit in indecision, which a, indie, a person that lives in indecision is a person that waits on somebody else to make a decision before they make a decision, then you'll never have the things that God challenged you to have. I want to speak to you and I want to challenge you and I want to push on your decision making today. Somebody shout, make a decision. Somebody shout, make a decision. And this is important because this, is a, this book is an interesting book. Numbers, numbers is an interesting book. We call it Numbers because in the second verse, the Bible tells uh, Moses to number the people or essentially have a census of the people. And because of that, from the Western world, the Latin Vulgate, we come with this idea of naming the chapter Numbers. But the chapter wouldn't have been, num been called Numbers to the early first century Hebrew uh, reader. When Moses wrote the letter, the idea was that the letter was not entitled uh, Numbers. The letter was actually entitled In the Wilderness. This is important for us to see because you can't understand the book of Numbers without understanding Levit Leviticus and Deuteronomy that preceded and postseded. You cannot take numbers out of context without understanding the journey of the children of Israel through Egypt and then their freedom from Egypt. Numbers, particularly Numbers 13, becomes a critical space for all of us to dialogue about because the book is written kind of in two spaces. The first space is dealing with the idea of who the children of Israel should be post-slavery and the promises that God has for them post-slavery. You remember the slavery that I'm talking about. The fact that they spent many years in Egyptian slavery. The fact that Moses had to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people, that God said to let his people go over ten times. After he eventually, on the tenth time, decided to, that uh, he would release them and let his people go, the Bible says that they got to the Red Sea and, and, uh, and Ramses, who was the Pharaoh at the time, released his army to go and get them and bring them back. Because uh, the reason why that is significant is because the devil never really lets you go that easy. I know you feel like you're delivered, but, you know, you know you're ne there is always, the enemy is always lurking, waiting to bring you back. Amen. So after a while, what happens is God tells Moses to take your stick out and throw it into the sea, and the sea parts, and the children of Israel moves, the Bible says, on dry ground, and they cross the Red Sea. This becomes a miraculous thing because on the other side of the Red Sea, uh, about two months after this miraculous miracle, the children of Israel look up and realize they're free. They realize that they now have the ability to, to govern their own lives, to walk in their own destiny, to make choices, watch this, and decisions that can affect their selves. That if I'm going to win, I'm going to win off my decisions. If I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose off of my decisions. This was the first time in many, many years that they were able to live out their own destiny destiny. And this became powerful because they had to do something now in freedom that they did not get an opportunity to do in slavery, and that is make decisions for their life. In slavery, they were told what to do. In slavery, the Egyptians told them how to handle, how to manage, and how, and how their life should go. In freedom, nobody was telling them that they need to get up and go to work. In freedom, nobody, told, nobody challenged them and told them that you've got to build cities. Nobody told them. Uh, there was no taskmaster over their shoulders saying that if you don't grow crops, then you're not going to eat. See, there are responsibilities over in freedom that you have to walk in that you don't get to walk in when you're in slavery. And what's happening now, two months post this space, or about a year and a half or so, post this space of, of being set free or being out of slavery, they are in a conundrum with themselves because they are free in body but still enslaved in their minds. 
And this is what happens, particularly for a person or people that have been in bondage. Now, I know we're not in slavery per se while we're here in this world, but there are thoughts that you operate in that you are enslaved to. There are behavior patterns that you are enslaved to. There are patterns that, of expectation that you are enslaved to. And you'll never want more if you never break the bondage of you accepting little. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And this is where people live, and we don't like to admit it. We like to just kind of compare ourselves to the person living next door to us. But you can't compare yourself to the person living next door to us if both of y'all are broke. Y'all are awfully quiet in here this morning. Is that, there, is that there is life on the other side of the eight. There is life on the other side of the 125. Y'all are awfully quiet in here. There is life that exists around you that if you're not careful, you will encapsulate yourself to the thought process of where you are and you'll never even know that you can make a decision for your life to go in a different direction. Am I talking to anybody in here? Somebody shout, make a decision. This is critical because decisions are at the fulcrum of moving your life forward. The children of Israel are now at the precipice of everything that God promised them. God said that I would give you a land that flows with milk and honey. God said I would give you land wells that you didn't have to dig. He said I would give you vineyards you wouldn't have to grow. He said I'll give you houses that you're not going to have to build. And this is the kind of miracle that sometimes was so magnanimous that it was hard for us to, to, to grasp and believe. Isn't it funny that it's hard for you to believe? that your life could be in a year or two years the exact opposite of the way that your life is right now? Isn't it weird to feel that what God has been putting in your spirit and keeps waking you up at night to show you that he still believes in you is hard for you to grasp in light of the situation that you're in right this second? It's funny because God doesn't care how messed up your situation is. He never talks about your situation. He always talks about the promise that he has for your life. And God will speak to your destiny in the middle of your right now and you've got to figure out am I going to live by the means of my right now or will I open up my heart and walk in my destiny and it's not because you say it it's going to be because you make a decision to do it somebody shout make a decision somebody shout make a decision the children are enslaved the children of Israel are enslaved in their minds only they are at the precipice of the promise. They go across the land to spy out the promise. Now, this idea of spy, it just really simply means they went on the other side to check out what God had for them. They were afraid to all go, so they got together and told Moses, how about a few of us go check it out in case it's not what God told us? Only 12 of us are die instead of all of us dying. Have you ever kind of tiptoed into the promise that God told you? You know, God said that, hey, I see elevation in your future. God tells you that you're supposed to be operating at a certain life, and you only send out resumes to the two businesses where you know somebody at. <laughs> Y'all are quiet in this room. You know how you just kind of tiptoe into the promise. You never really step into what God is. They sent 12 spies over to view the land. These 12 spies, they go and they survive for over 40 days. They go and they get to know the people. They go and they spy out and they can come back and answer every question that Moses told them to answer. What is the land like? What are the people like? What is their housing like? Moses wasn't sending them over there so that they could tell, so that they could bring back whether or not they could live in the land. He sent them over there so that there can be a, a, a ratification of what God promised them. They came back with that ratification. They said, Moses, the land is exactly how God told us it would be. He said, the land is perfect. It is beautiful. It is lush. It is wonderful. This is moving into verses uh, uh, 10 through verses 20 in chapter 13. They said, it is wonderful. The land is great. He says, we brought back these wonderful fruit from the land. There was so much fruit in the land that they had to have two men carry the fruit as they crossed back across the Jordan to, uh, to, to sit with Moses and to tell Moses about it. He says that, man, this is everything that God promised us. Moses gathered the troops to prepare to go across and possess what God promised them. But 10 of the 12 spies that went across stood up and said, even though it's everything that God told us, we can't have it. The question was, why can't we have it? What in the world would make them believe that they couldn't have it? See, here's the thought process, is that even though they were free, they were still slaves. 
They had never had victories on their own. They never, had, they never could see themselves running businesses. They never saw themselves as CEOs. They never could really understand what it meant to, to run a city, to govern themselves. They always had over the last, this is a generation that always had somebody telling them what they should accept and what they should do and how they should live. Y'all are not talking back to me in here because there are some of us in here that, don't, that say, hey, man, I don't really see that operating in my life. But see, you are the one that don't ever get up and vote. And that's why the street don't get fixed and that's why the y'all are awfully quiet in here and you just take the schools that they give you and take the teachers that they say you're supposed to have and we don't even know somebody say I don't even know you don't even know the power that you could have if you just had the nerve to stop fussing at all of your elected officials and work with one of your elected officials are you hearing what I'm saying? And this is, but this was the mentality. The mentality was, so they started to fuss and complain. And they say, Moses, you got us out here. You should have just left us in Egypt. In other words, you should have just left us in a place where we had a better president that could do everything that we wanted to do. And I would agree with most of what he did. Instead of standing into the power that has been invested in me, in my spirit and at the voting poll, and say that I have a say in my life. Y'all are awfully quiet. Somebody shout, I have a say in my life. That's no, and you don't give that power to the preacher, and you don't give that power to your best friend, and you don't give that power to your hating girlfriend, and you don't give that power to a politician. You have the power for your life. Get up and walk in the power that God has called. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Stop acting like you have no power. God has anointed you with power. And even though you're in spaces where you may not have operated, your faith has to say that everything I need to live on the other side is waiting for me to get to the other side. And the church said, this becomes critical. Boy, y'all are awfully quiet in here today. The church, because I know y'all got it all together on this side, so I'm going to talk to y'all in the middle. So what happens now is that they, they make a decision. They look up and they make a decision. And they decide that we're not going across. Caleb and Joshua stand up and say, we are more than able to go over and do this. But you know how sometimes an older generation will, will treat a younger generation, a generation that is young, usually is idealistic and has ideas that are very different than the generation that preceded it. And the only difference between generations is the fact that one generation has lived more life than the other generation. And you got to be careful with this thing called life because there is nothing like life that will make you stop living. Y'all will get that tomorrow. So, but I'm going to talk to y'all. There is nothing like living life that will make you want to say, I, that I, there's nothing like having an experience in this life that will make you say, it will never happen for me. It's nothing like having an experience in life that will make you say, we ain't never going to get that. There is nothing like life that say, we're never going to go nowhere. Every time we take a step forward, we always take a step backwards. See, life is funny. And you've got to be careful not letting life take the life away from you or you will always have what you have. But Caleb and Joshua said that I'm exhausted with having what I have. I know you built it, but God said we should have more. I know you planted it, but God said we should do more. I know that it, it worked out while you had it, but it is our turn to take this thing to another level. And you've got to release us. This is Joshua and Caleb. You've got to release us to go to the other side because Egypt was the strength of your generation. And the promised land will be the strength of ours. And if you keep those of us that are capable of going to the promised land in this space, then we will never become as a people who God called us to become. So what God does is instead of letting them go back to Egypt and be slaves like they wanted to become slaves, what happens now, and you got to watch what I mean when I say slaves. I'm not, I'm not saying that they necessarily want to go back and become slaves, but you know how it is. If you're not careful, you know there's a generation that will have you keep going around an old landmark because it worked for them. Ah. 
I'm preaching better than y'all preaching. Y'all are not talking back to me. They'll have you voting for the same people because it works for them. Y'all are not talking back to me. They'll have you worshiping the same way because it works for them. I wish I was preaching to somebody in here. They're, if you're not careful, their pre your presentation will be like their presentation because it works for them. And you've got to understand that for every generation, there are problems for every generation. And when your generation refuses to move into the dimension of which you have been anointed to solve problems, then you keep treading on problems of a past generation. And the reason why some of y'all young folk are so exhausted with church and exhausted with community and exhausted with the policies and exhausted with the politician is because you don't have the courage to get up and vote for who values where you're trying to go. Because, y'all, boy, the, boy, I thought I have at least 25 folks in here that say I'm ready to do something different. Somebody shout, I'm ready to do something different. The reason why this becomes important is because now the children of Israel are stuck. And instead of God sending them backwards, God says, it's not that I'm going to send you backwards, but neither can you go forward. And now, they, but now what God says is for the next 40 years, I'm going to give you all some time to think about it, and we'll be in the wilderness. This is why the, script, the, the Hebrew would have looked at this text, and, or this, this book, and not called it Numbers. They would have called it in the wilderness. And they, this is the time, the book of Numbers chronicles the time of the children of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness. As they moved for 40 years, 38 years, as they walked, two years while they came back and sat down and the Deuteronomy was given to them again, the law was given again. They walked around the wilderness and as they walked around the wilderness God was waiting on a generation to die off so that he can move his, his children to the, plot, the next place where God told them to go. And it wasn't because they did not have the aptitude to go. They made a decision not to go. You better hear what I'm saying. They made a decision. Somebody shout a decision. They made a decision that we're not going. They made a decision that we're not able. They made a decision that we're better where we were. They made a decision that we're stronger as a people when we did it this way. And we won't even try to do it that way because this, because this is better for our lives. They made a decision. And you better be careful in your life accepting somebody else's decisions because you'll look up and be walking in somebody else's destiny instead of the destiny that God called for you. Not because you couldn't do it. It, but because you let somebody else make decisions for you. Y'all are awfully quiet in this. I, I appreciate what you did, but I've got somewhere I've got to go. I appreciate what you built, but I've got to build something for myself. And this is the time, and I hear the Spirit of God saying that this is the time for the children of God to be able to, to, to stand up, brother, and to walk in the power that he has given them for the moment that he has put them in this earth. And you cannot rise ride on grandmama's anointing and you can't ride off a of granddad's word you got to get a word for your own life and make a decision to walk in it and see what God is going to do in your life somebody shall make a decision you better realize how important decisions are. I tell the story about my friend in college. And one day he decides in college that he's going to just enjoy the evening. And he, takes, and he takes a drug that he ends up taking almost 30 years of his life to get off of. In a, in a quick 30 seconds of taking the drugs, it has taken him almost 30 years for him to get off of this drug. This is crazy. One decision can change your life. Y'all are awfully quiet in here. Some of y'all that married the wrong person, one decision in your life. Y'all are awfully quiet in here. I'm coming down your way. One decision can change your life. And you better be in charge of your life, full of the Holy Spirit, loaded with faith in God, that when I make this decision, it's going to change my entire death. Where are my decision makers at? Raise your voice and give God a shout of praise. I need some help in this house. Find your neighbor real quick and tell them, make a decision. You don't have to be in poverty. You got to decide you're not going to be in poverty. You got to decide you're not going to be angry. You got to decide you're not going to be lonely. It's all in the decision. Somebody shall make a decision. It was a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
as he stood at the base of the Lincoln Memorial. They, he was giving a script that he had spent almost two and a half weeks to help pen. He stood and he was expressing his thoughts to the nation. There were over 200,000 people that were standing in front of him. Millions watching on TV. The story says that President Kennedy rallied around his television with his brothers and his cabinet to watch this march on Washington. After about 12 minutes into his speech, Dr. King was giving a grade B minus speech. He was reading off of his paper and he was going through something that he had taken his time and didactically put together so that the whole world would be able to receive what it is that he was saying. And there was a lady sitting in the front row who started to sense the moment was slipping away from him. She started to sense that he was going to miss the moment because the atmosphere was right for him. And she remembered a dream that he talked about when he was preaching at a little baptism this church about three weeks ago. Her name was Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia Jackson yelled up at Dr. Martin Luther King. Tell him about the dream, Martin. And she said that she got nervous as she started to express it and she started to say it. She got nervous because she didn't want to interrupt the moment and she didn't want the moment to be about her. But Dr. King kept on script and kept moving as he explained. And she said that she sensed in her spirit he was going to miss the moment. She said, I've got a decision to make. I can keep my mouth shut or I can help him get into this moment so that he can change the destiny of our world. She said, I made the decision and she said it a second time. Martin, tell him about the dream. And, the, and the, if you watch the tape, he looked over at her for a second. He paused and he began to move his notes over to the side. He said that today... We face difficulties today and tomorrow. He say, but deep in my spirit, I still have a dream. Y'all are not talking back to me. I don't know who I'm talking to, but your destiny can change with one decision. I need somebody that's got a decision to make to raise your voice and give God a shout of praise. Tell your neighbor, Rachel, tell your neighbor, make a decision, make a decision. Tell them, make a decision, you might change my life. Make a decision, you might shift this church. Make a decision, you might change your life. I need some of y'all are not talking back to me. I can go on with my life if you make a decision. I can go ahead and find who really want to love me if you make a decision. But you've got to make a decision. Somebody shall make a decision. This is important. And if you don't make decisions, I wrote down three things that I want you to write down in your notes. If you make poor decisions, then the, your whole journey can be altered by making poor decisions. I want you to write down three things that the children of Israel did for themselves. Because chapter 13 marks the results of what happened to a people when they made a bad decision. Chapter 13 is the space where they learn the results of what happened when they made that fatal decision that we're not going where God told us we should go. And God said that you won't go back, but neither will you go forward. And I'm talking to a bunch of people that feel like they're just doing this. I don't know if I'm preaching to you, but, but it's that one decision that, made, that took months for you to back off of. That one decision that has taken years for you to rebuild your character with. Y'all are not talking back to me. That one decision, aren't there some decisions you have in your head right now that you wish, boy, if I would have did this different, if I would have said that different, I wouldn't be in the space that I'm in right now had I not made that decision. Numbers 13 represents that decision, that decision, that decision, that decision. God, why did I make that? Are you still going to use me? Are you still going to break, break, break me through? Are you still, do you still have a destiny? Because God, I used that decision and I've spent the last five years trying to live down a mistake that I made in 30 seconds. God, I didn't mean to be that angry, but I'm so angry they gave me 10 years in a proverbial prison to think about the decision that I made. God, I didn't mean to say what I said, but, I, but now I've got to live with the decision that I made. You better watch yourself because the enemy is always bringing choices up, up beside you. And chapter 13 is the, is the chapter that reminds us of the times where we believe the devil 
angel on our shoulder instead of the angel on our other shoulder. It is the time where we believed in our flesh instead of that God would work it out for us. Am I talking to anybody or am I by myself in this room? Chapter, he says, he says, there are three things I want you to put down in your notes. Three results of making poor decisions. I want you to see what happened with the children of Israel. The first result, the first result of poor decisions is that they forfeited seasons of generational productivity and fruitfulness. They forfeited seasons of generational productivity and fruitfulness. What happens now is that the children of Israel, they are now at the precipice of their destiny. And when they come across, they bring the fruit across and they lay it down before Moses. And they tell Moses that this is the fruit. They brought pomegranates and grapes and figs that were befitting for giants. They were able to now have them at their, at their disposal. They looked at Moses and the Bible says that they told Moses that we're not, we're not able to go across and, and harvest the harvest that God has for us. Watch what happens now. You've got to remember what we learned two weeks ago is that the scripture says that Moses told them to go and bring back fruit. Why? Because this was the season of the ripe grape. It was the season. Somebody shout seasons. There is a season in your life by which you can have high levels of productivity and high levels of fruitfulness. But some things, before they're decided upon, have to be discerned. And seasons are discerned. Season, you have to sense that you're in a season. Am I talking to anybody in here? You've got to sense that God is on you, that this is your time, that this is your moment. You just have to know what you know on the inside. Seasons is not something that you can look up on the calendar and say, I'm going to start start my business on January 31st and then I was going to run for about five years and then it'll be over around February of 2008. You don't get seasons don't work like that. You got a sense that this is my moment. Am I talking to anybody that just got a feeling down deep? See this is what the old saints used to say. They used to say I got a feeling deep down on the inside that's telling me, y'all ain't talking back to me, that's telling me to run off. I can't, I can't describe it. I can't tell you where it comes from I just know it's making me get up and walk out my dream I know it's making me get up and run for the thing you said I should never have I don't know it but I sense that this is my time now you've got to understand the way that the Hebrew thinks he does not think the way that us Westerners think because we have seasons on a Gregorian calendar in the Hebrew back particularly in the first century everything in the Hebrew world dealt with seasons nothing was an exact date it was always roundabout. Y'all know how it is. Some of y'all live by that today. I'm going to be there about, right about. You're going to be there at six, you get there about. You know, it's all uh, in the in the Hebrew world. Everything was sick. See, you can t you say at twelve o'clock it's gonna be morning, and it goes all the way to eleven fifty nine. It wouldn't have worked that way in the Hebrew culture. In the Hebrew culture, day starts at dusk. It doesn't even start when the sun comes up. It actually starts when the sun's going down. But there is no figurative time that it is because depending on what time of the year they're in, dusk could start at four thirty, or maybe it could start at six thirty, depending on what time of the year it is. You just kind of have a season by which you have to operate. Watch this. And everything you've got to get done before the sun goes down is all dependent on the season by which they're in. This is the way days operate. There is no day. And you've got to figure it out. That's why we struggle to understand when was Jesus raised from the dead. Because when we think about the morning, we think about around 645 that Jesus got up around the time your coffee machine got, got going. And Jesus woke up, rose up when you rose up. Well, in reality, Jesus would have gotten up some time at the, in the morning, which would have been in the dusk of the evening instead of the morning. Watch this, which means that instead of Jesus working while it was day, Jesus did his work while it was night. Now, this is important for you to understand because it's in the dark where God is doing his greatest work in your life. See, you give God a praise when the joy shows up, but God was doing his best work when the darkness was happening in your Oh, I wish I was preaching to somebody. You waiting on God to fix it. God's saying, I fixed it while you were sleeping. God, help me. God said, I fixed it while you were crying. I fixed it when you said it couldn't be done. I didn't, have, I didn't just do it. I was doing it when you gave up. And I wish I had some help in here. God is the kind of God that is working, as the writer said, in the midnight hour. 
He said, so, so, so not only are there, are there days uh, kind of about that way, their months are the exact same way. Hebrew months are not start on January 1st and ends on the 31st. The average Hebrew month over a 12-month span is about 29 and a half days. That means that some months got about 27 and a half days and other months got about 32 days. I know that sounds weird to us, but they determine their months not based on calendar days, but based on the new moon. When the new moon starts to phase out and show up, that's a day and a half event, any of y'all that keep up with the moon. That's a day, you don't wake up and say, oh, wow, the moon is here. It's a new month. The moon starts to phase itself in as the earth starts to move. And depending on what season that is, that could take a day and a half. It could take three days before they say there's a full moon outside. This is the way they determine their month. Not just the month, the year. According to the Bible in the Old Testament, they determine their year not based on a calendar that said December 31st. First, it's going to be a new year. They said when the harvest of barley is full, then you can start your new year. This is one of the reasons why the festival of the wheat, y'all not talking back to me, because they were waiting on the fullness of the wheat before they could even begin the festivals in which they could even honor God in. Now, the wheat was not harvested on one day. They didn't wake up one day and say, oh, man, the harvest is full today. The harvest took some time before it became full. And when it was full, after a course of two to three to four weeks, they were able to declare, the, the, the synagogue leaders were able to declare that the harvest is full and they could celebrate Rosh Hashanah, which is, the, which is the new year. They could celebrate that there's a new year and there's a lot for us to celebrate. You've got to be able to discern when God is doing something new. I wish I was helping somebody. See, you waiting on some prophet or some pastor or some preacher to come say, now is the time. God said, no, you got a sense that God is doing something new. And when you start to sense that God is doing something new, you got to get in the ready position. Y'all, and I, I need all my jump ropers to know what I'm talking about. Y'all, see, some of y'all don't even know what I'm doing right now. How many of y'all jump rope? See, when they start rolling the rope like this and you get ready to go in, you don't just jump in. You got to get in the ready position. I need somebody to get in the ready position. I need somebody to say it ain't time yet, but I'm starting to catch rhythm with where the Holy Ghost is going. I wish somebody raised their voice and shout that I'm ready. He says, y'all sit down, y'all sit down, y'all sit down, y'all sit down. I'm almost done, but I feel like God is getting somebody in rhythm. Somebody shout rhythm. Somebody shout rhythm. Because on the other side, that he has prepared the land for you. He has prepared the entire land. And we forfeit these seasons of generational productivity. God don't want us in this new building. God don't want us to move. God don't want us to have another this. God don't want the church to do that. God don't want you to take your family and take, a, take your children to a better school. This ain't the Holy Ghost. Child, I can't see it. I don't understand. And what happens is they are looking over at where you're trying to go. And they're saying that I can't cannot afford to be where your dream has you. God, I'm saying this better than y'all shouting amen for. Is that I see your dream and we can't afford what you dreaming. I see your dream and we cannot manage what God is saying to you. I see your dream and we cannot overtake what God is doing. The problem is, is that they're seeing it through natural eyes and not seeing it the way God did. What happened before the children of Israel went into any major space that God promised them, God got there before they got there. I'm helping somebody in here. What would happen is God would go before them and he would get in the ear of the leaders and he would tell them that the Israelites are coming. And the Israelites thought that the people thought that the Israelites were actually bigger than they really were because when the Lord shows up, God has a way of taking little and making... Oh, God, I wish I had some help. And making it seem like much. And what would happen is cities that were bigger than them and men that were stronger than them would be shaken in their proverbial boots because the Israelites are coming. No, the Israelites wasn't so suchy much. They just had a God that was so suchy much. And all they had to do was show up and walk in the promise because God had prepared the land that was already ready for them the issue was not was the land ready but could they discern that they were in a season that God said that they could have a harvest I need somebody that knows they're in a season to raise your voice and shout I'm in my season it's a season of the ripe grape 
But if you don't make a decision, you'll forfeit the seasons of productivity. And now your children have to buy a house instead of being you being the first one buying a house. Y'all are not talking back to me in here. Now your children have to get out of poverty instead of you being the first one to get out of poverty. See, God gives you these opportunities, and we are so stuck on what we are comfortable in that we never take a chance on what God has spoken over our lives and our children. Somebody shout our children. That's number two. Number two is that their sons and daughters had to fight generational battles that they should have won for them. God, I'm preaching better than y'all shouting amen. The Bible says that they said, and by the way, the giants of Anak are there. In other words, we can't beat these giants, both scientifically and geologically. There is proof that there were people that stood over seven and eight, nine feet tall by the masses. They're, they were called the Nephilim. Some of them were called Nephilim. Others were called the Anakim. And, and they are called Anak, which is the land that they were from. You guys know Goliath. Goliath was a, a, an Anak. He was a descendant of Anak. David defeats Goliath. Um, uh, and these are the guys that were in the land. They go over to the land and they say that these race of giants are in the land and we cannot defeat them. And what happens now is that instead of them walking in the power of their generation to solve problems connected to their generation, they pass them down to their children. About 14 chapters later, Later, the Bible says that a younger generation, Joshua and Caleb, had to do battle with the, with the Anakim, and they defeated the Anakim. The problem is, is that while they did defeat the Anakim, they were never supposed to fight the Anakim. Their mamas and daddies were supposed to beat the Anakim. I wish I was talking to somebody. See, you will never win a battle where you're not willing to confront a problem, and you'll never confront the problem if you cannot see yourself winning over the problem. And what happened is they saw themselves in light of the giants and they said, I'll pass climate to my children. I mean, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. They said that I'll pass health care to my children. I didn't mean that. I didn't mean that. They said, I'm going to pass my nicotine habit to my babies. I'm going to pass divorce to my babies. And your children shouldn't be trying to figure out how to break the curse of divorce over the family. You were supposed to break the curse over the family. I'm preaching better than y'all are saying amen for You've got, there are battles in this lifetime that if you get the victory over, your children will never have to battle. But you've got to take your precaution and get on your God's strength and walk in the land that God promised you. Am I preaching to anybody that's got a battle? I need somebody that's in a battle right now, a battle for your marriage, a battle for your money, a battle for your sanity, a battle for your generational comfort. I need somebody that's in a battle. A ba Look, God, I don't want to live in poverty like my grandmother lived. My grandmama lived. My mama lived. Now I, I want to break the curse of poverty. But if you don't do battle with your money, y'all are talking. Y'all are awfully quiet in here. If you don't do battle, see, here's the thing. We don't even look at them as being enemies because we don't study the word of God. If you study the word of God, you'll see that poverty is an enemy. Depression is an enemy. Mental illness is an enemy. Y'all are not talking back to me in here. Greed is an enemy. And God says that if you want to battle your enemies, stop looking for a man that's got horns on his head and stop looking to blame it on the man. You know the man. Y'all know the man, don't you? Y'all know the man. Everybody in this room know the man. You just don't have an address for the man. You don't have a phone number for the man. You don't have an email number for the man. But you know the man. You know what I'm saying. Here's the reality about the man. Maybe you are that man. Maybe the one that's holding your destiny back, the one that's keeping you from college, the one that's keeping you from breaking the curses, sitting in the chair that you're in right now. I wish I had some help in here. Y'all are, we so quick. See, what happens is we wait for somebody that can be the picture of, of the reason for why we're not walking and moving in the things that God called us. So we can't wait to see who gets to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue for us to give a face of what the man looks like. But the reality is, is that man is not the one that's not raising your children. I'm not, y'all, y'all off the quiet. See, it's not his fault that you don't go to none of your daughter's ball games. Okay, I'm going to help y'all. It's not y'all not talking back to me. It's not that y'all not talking back to me. And then you got the nerve to come to church and say, Pastor, the man and the devil, and it's the ism. It's because I'm black. It's because I'm a woman. It's because I'm this. It's because I'm that. And maybe it's because you're you. Oh, the church is awfully quiet in here. But what if you served a God that had the power to help you get over you? 
So oh, I wish I was preaching to somebody in this house. Somebody lay your hand on yourself and say, God, deliver me from me. I don't want to be the reason that we don't prosper. I don't want to be the reason this, this marriage fails. I don't want to be the reason our children resent us. Lord, help me get over me. I don't want to pass this battle to my babies. I don't want my children battling the stuff I'm dealing with. I don't want my children battling my emotional issues and my anxiety issues. I don't want my children growing up a workaholic. I don't want my, I am forcing myself to break generational curses. Y'all are awfully quiet in this room because I don't want them to have to rebuild what I should be tearing down. He said the third thing, somebody shout number three. Is that when you don't make good decisions and when you make poor decisions over your life, you end up reinforcing Satan's lies. Satan is always in your ear and he's telling you stuff. You can't do this. You can't walk in that. You're not going to win. You're not the victor. The people want somebody else. You can't. You're not as good as she is. You don't sound as well as he sounds. That enemy is always in your ear telling you what you can't be and who you can't be and how you shouldn't. The enemy will keep you in the space called right now. He will keep you in what you've had and make you think you're doing something when you're actually doing nothing. And if you're not careful, you'll wake up one day and be average. You'll wake up one day and say that this is everything that I was hoping I would not be. You'll wake up one day and say, God, God, I can't believe this is my life because I never tried anything. And I never went to the batter's box to, to even strike out, let alone get a hit. You look up and you say, God, where did all my time go? And where has all my money went? I'm 55 years old now and I've never even tried anything. And now you want to live. Y'all ain't talking back to me. Now you want to find a way to live. And you realize that all the things you made an attachment to that you're supposed to have for the rest of your life, you're trying to cut attachments to them because you're ready to live now. You get your life back. You know, you hearing what I'm saying? And this is what happens is that the children of Israel, they, they looked and they came back to Moses and they said that, look, we looked at the giants and we were as grasshoppers in our own sight. And because we were grasshoppers in our sight, we became grasshoppers in their sight. Did you hear what I just said to you? See, they said because... We didn't think our vote counted. We never voted. So now they don't come and take care of our needs because we thought we didn't matter. Now they think we don't matter. Y'all are awfully quiet. Boy, I'm, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. You, you didn't think your dream mattered, so you put everybody else's dream in front of your dream, and now nobody wants to help you with your dream because you didn't think your dream mattered, and now they don't think your dream matters. Uh, uh, y'all are awfully... Uh, and now you're in a season that's at the end of the right season. God help me. And people are just doing the mathematics. They're saying I could jump on board, but we're at the end of a season. So I can get what I need to get at the end of this season, or I can wait till somebody else's season come around and jump on theirs and get the whole gamut. And this is the challenge. This is what happens when you wait and don't make decisions of your life. Is you just keep reinforcing Satan's lies. You're not smart enough. You don't deserve it. You will never afford that. You will never, nobody will ever buy into you. You can't discipline your mind just to, to run a company and run a business. You can't do that. You, you, you know that you're more gifted than the people you work with, but hey, it's safe. Let's just be safe. Y'all are not talking back to me in here. You got a good job that you complain about all the time because it never meets the needs that you have. Y'all are not talking back to me. And I can never develop to who I could be because if I go to my next level, then it requires more than what I've gotten comfortable with. <sighs> I can't finance my dream, so I stay in safe. My dream, I can't afford what I'm dreaming, so I never, I never step into it. Are y'all following what I'm saying? And this becomes a challenge. And this is what the children of Israel did in Numbers chapter 13. They made a decision to be who they've always been, and God had a problem with it. And I'm speaking to somebody in this room today where God has a problem with you deciding that this is enough. God has a problem with you deciding that where I've been is where I need to go. Not when, you're, not when your tank is still half full. Not when your tank is still half full. 
Not when you still have a lot of people that you got to serve and people that you need to help and communities that need your voice and, pe- and businesses that can undergird your children's college. Not when, you, not when you've got all of that in the balance, you don't get to say, I'm done. You don't get to say, I'm done. You don't get to say, I'm done. And, and oh God, I don't want to make, make another decision that's going to make me wonder in the wilderness of my life. Am I preaching to anybody? Am I preaching to anybody? Stand to your feet if I'm talking to you. Stand to your feet. We're going to pray. We're going to take our communion and we're going to head home. We're going to pray. We're going to take our communion and we're going to head home. How many, of you, how many of you understood what I was talking about? How many of you felt what I was preaching? I want you to hear what I'm trying to tell you. Is you will look up and in your lifetime, you will look back and you'll ask yourself, what in the world? has happened to the time. And the Bible said that for 40 years, they wandered through the wilderness, at least 38 of the years, they wandered through the wilderness. And God said, I let all the people of the generation that didn't want to go, he said, I let them die out. He said, I let them all die out until there was only a generation of people that had the courage to go across, watch this, and defeat the same enemies that their parents were anointed to defeat. I want to pray for us today. I want to pray for us today. You're not going to die with dreams left on the shelf. No, you're not. You're not going to die full. You're not going to grow old with all your best ideas still in your spirit. You're going to know whether they worked or not. Every, every idea is not going to work, but you should at least know whether, they're going to, whether they worked or not. Am I talking to anybody in here? But I don't have the numbers, and I don't have the this, and I don't have the that. You've got to understand that, that, that provision follows vision. And if you walk in your vision, God starts sending all that you need to pull it. Now, now even if the, the provision never comes, let me tell you how God works. He told a little boy, he said, bring me your lunch. The little boy brought the lunch. He says, I got a few fish, and I got a couple loaves of bread. And God looked over at the disciples, and the disciples said, there are over 5,000 people here. They said, let's just let them go. Let's just let them go to the city and get their own meal tonight. And God said, but I got these fish, and I got these five loaves of bread. And there was somebody who was willing to sow the little bit that they had. He said, I don't know how to not give a return on somebody that's got the vision to see 5,000 people eat even though he got two fish and five loaves. So the Bible says that he told the disciples, have everybody sit down. And then he began to pray over the bread. And then the Bible said he broke the bread. And then he started giving it out. And he would go into the basket, and he gave it out. He said, two fish and five loaves. He said, give this to the third family. He said, you give this to the 10th family. Two fish and five loaves. He said, you give this to the 100th family. And you give this to the first thousand. He said, you give this to the the 2,500th person. And he kept going into this little basket that only had two fish and five loaves. And he fed 5,000 men and their wives and their children. And the Bible said that when he got done, he had 12 baskets that he didn't know what to do with. (laughs) He said, I got 12 baskets. And watch what he does. He gives a basket to each of his unbelieving disciples. (laughs) God, help me in this place. He said he gave a basket to each of his unbelieving disciples. And I believe that that's the way God wants to bless us. If we have the nerve to take our little selves into a land of giants and give ourselves to God and say, God, just break us, bless us, and feed us to the city of San Diego that houses can be blessed and communities can be blessed and the city can be blessed and maybe this nation can be blessed 
because you never got to an edge and said, God, we can't do it. Let me let you in on a little secret. You couldn't do all the stuff you have done. You couldn't. Can I let you in on a little secret about your life? If it had not been for the Lord on your side, you knew you wouldn't have got through that one season. And you know what season I'm talking about. Am I talking to anybody in here? If the truth be told, if the truth be told, so Father, we bless you today. We honor you and we thank you. Thank you for this word that will press on us and push us and challenge us to be better, to do better, but more than anything, to be courageous and to discern the season and to make the decisions. And Father, I pray for support around every person who has a major decision to make in their life now. I pray for the support. I pray for the, the resources and the finances that it would happen in your life in the master's name of Jesus Christ. If that word blessed you, I want you to give God a hand praise it. If that word bless you, come on, bring the table. Bring the table this time. Bring the table. Move as quickly as we can. They're going to bring our, our communion table, but I want you guys to listen to the word of the Lord in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says this. This is Paul speaking about the Lord's Supper, what we're about to partake in and share today. He says, for I have received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup of the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of the bread and drink of this cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks of this cup, listen very carefully, of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And for this reason, let a man examine himself, and then so let him or her eat of the bread and drink from this cup. For he who eats and drinks in this unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself because they do not discern, there that word is again, the Lord's body. 